Welcome to our webinar, uh, Capital Project Planning and Financing, What an Association Needs to Know. My name is Ed Guttenplan. I'm your moderator. And this is another in Wilkin and Guttenplan's series of webinars on various topics so relating to community associations. Tonight, our program is going to cover the range of issues relating to financing capital projects and putting them together so they work. And we have a, a good selection of speakers covering all the gamuts of what you would need covered from the association manager level to the attorney to the accountant and the banker. So I hope you find this interesting and informative. Um, just a few housekeeping rules before we get started with the program. You can email us at any time questions as we go. Just email them on the little panel on your screen. If it's appropriate, we'll ask the question during the presentation. Or if we have time at the end, we'll ask the questions at the end of the presentation. If for some reason, um, because we're limiting this presentation to one hour, if we don't get to your question or you have questions you think of um, later, you will find the contact information for all of the speakers on the last slide in the program. In addition, if you don't catch the information at the time this webinar is cast, you can go to the Wilkin and Gutten Plan website, hit, click on the tab for association resources, and the webinar will be posted on that website along with all of the slides and the contact information. You'll also find on that tab for association resources our past webinars, um, some of which are recorded, some of which are, or exist in terms of PowerPoint presentations only along with a, a number of other resources related to community associations. Um, I also want to mention that um, we do have a few other webinars coming up. Um, we have a co-op concerns webinar coming up on April 28th, a transitions from sponsor control webinar planned for May of 2011, a reserve studies program planned for June of 2011, and a high-rise and mixed-use development program on September, sometime in September of 2011. So keep your eyes out for those. If you are not on our mailing list, email us. We'll put you on our mailing list, and you'll be sure to get the email blast announcement of those programs. What I'm going to do is introduce all of the speakers first so we get that out of the way and the program can then roll naturally through all of the slides. We will also have a few polling questions intermixed with the program so that we get a sense of the audience and your interests and concerns as we continue through the program. Finally, as always, we welcome your feedback as to what may be of interest in future programs or um, comments you may have regarding this program. So now to our esteemed panel of experts here tonight. I'm going to read them in the order that you're going to hear them speak. First of which is the grandfather of Community Association Accounting, Ed Wilkin, who I've known for almost 30 years and is an expert in the field. Ed was co has co-founded Wilkin and Gutton Plan um, in 19... 83. Since founding the firm, he has worked with over a thousand community associations, uh, with, and with 30 years of experience, he's gained extensive knowledge and experience concerning auditing and accounting for community associations. He also has a significant litigation support background, specifically with developer transition and forensic and fraud accounting. He's a past president and board member of New Jersey CAI. In addition, has been a speaker and author for CAI on the national and local levels. Prior to co-founding Wilkin and Gutton Plan, Ed was a partner in a regional accounting firm. Next up, we'll have Kathy Kintner. For the past 13 years, Kathy has been the on-site association manager for Union Gap Village Condominium Association. The community sits on 52 acres outside of Clinton, has 34 buildings, and that houses 438 units. As part of her responsibilities, Kathy supervises six employees of the community. 
Prior to this position, she worked in the mechanical construction field for 12 years. Next up from the banking sector is Stephen Block. Steve Block is the Senior Vice President at Capital One Bank's Business Banking Group. He currently manages the bank's Common Interest Realty Association business in New Jersey, which provides financing and capital improvement projects to associations. Steve lives in a condominium community and has served on the board as well as provided consultations when his association needed financing for large capital improvement projects. He is an active member of New Jersey CAI, where he serves as a board member and officer as, and is involved in various committees. Next, again, second banker is David Sharabani. David is vice president with Popular Association Banking in his role he works with associations and through property management firms to provide financing solutions for associations by funding a variety of projects and restorations providing loans. In addition, he can provide cash manage management services to associations that have borrowed money for financing. He is an active member in New Jersey CAI and has served as a chairperson of the golf committee. He also frequently attends many of their functions. Last up, but not least, is Ken Sauter, batting cleanup. Ken is a shareholder in the Morristown Law Firm of Berman, Sauter, Record, and Jardim, D.C. The firm represents over 250 community associations throughout New Jersey. The majority of Ken's practice is devoted to real estate matters with a substantial concentration uh, in the representation of community associations and community association lenders. He is a member of the Board of Directors of the New Jersey Chapter of CAI and has served as a chairperson of its Editorial Education and Legislation Activities Committee. Before attending Villanova School of Law, Ken was a licensed CPA and an accountant with Price Waterhouse. So that's your team for tonight. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Granddad Ed Wilkins to start off the presentation. Thank you, Ed, for that uh, tremendous introduction. Uh, it's going to be hard for me to, to uh, live up to all that going through my presentation. Um, the first thing we're going to do before we get into my project is, um, in my presentation section, is give you a polling question. We, wanted, we have quite a diverse uh, group tonight, and I want to get an idea of uh, where, where you guys uh, stand uh, within uh, the reason why you're atten attending the program tonight and why, um, so we can get a little bit more information. Um, so you have the polling question up. Uh, you can only select one answer, so select one, and uh, it'll give us some information as to uh, your background and the reason you're attending. Try to answer quickly so we can move the program along. The questions get easier as we go along, so. Okay, so uh, I want to start off the program uh, just to describe and, and talk a little bit about what a capital project is. Um, I guess if it were to look into in a dictionary, you'd see uh, it, it would be a major or full replacement or improvement of the infrastructure or a building component. Um, it's something that would not be funded out of your operating budget, and it uh, would be something that would be replaced in kind or with a totally different material or design. An example of that would be um, wood to vinyl siding. Um, some examples, some other capital projects would be roofing, siding, pavement, and uh, as far as an improvement, potentially a, a clubhouse uh, addition. And we had a couple of associations over the years that have uh, added to the clubhouse, and that qualifies as a capital uh, capital project. What I'd like to do now, uh, I have uh, Kathy, who uh, actually was our first association that we ever had, that I ever had starting in, uh, in the practice. It goes way, way back to uh, the uh, late 70s. Um, and, uh, Kathy's been a client of mine uh, since then. She was number one, and she's still number one in my heart. Uh, she's going to tell you about uh, 
their story. Uh, they had a capital project uh, that uh, happened a uh, couple of years ago, and she's going to go through and give you an idea of how that was handled and and, and uh, give you her story. Kathy, it's all yours. Thank you, Ed, for that introduction. As you can see, what's, uh, what's on the screen now is a before and after picture of a section of my condominium complex. Um, I have 34 buildings plus a clubhouse, which housed 438 units. Um, the project was started in 1976 and completed in 1979. So as you can see, the cedar siding, cedar and pine siding, was deteriorating. We did a cycle of every five years each building would be um, sanded down. We would replace pieces of the cedar siding and then we would have an outside contractor come in and put solid stain on it. We did this for several years so that each building was done every five years. What happened in 2006 is we realized that we could not keep up with the buildings. We couldn't do enough buildings every year so that they would be done every five years. Um, we then went to considering hiring a contractor to replace all the cedar siding with additional cedar. When we realized that the cost of the cedar siding was, gonna cost, was just going to exceed what we could afford, um, the cost of cedar was going up and the manpower to replace the siding was going up, which led us to a different path. The first step was to get the complete board um, online with the project. How we did this, um, I brought to the board the reasons why I felt the maintenance was not, we couldn't keep up with the maintenance on the buildings as it was. We um, hired an engineering firm to give us the cost of the continuing the cedar siding and to confirm what we believed, that it would just be too expensive. So now with the board on, they were all, all the trustees were agree, agreeing on the project. We sent an initial letter out to the owners with the board's intention on um, how the project was going to proceed. At that point, we did make the decision that it would be vinyl siding. We had an open meeting with the residents, at which point we discussed what our plans were. And at that meeting, we showed the engineering report and explained why it would continue to cost too much to keep the cedar and why we needed to replace the siding with a different um, material. At that meeting, we also established an ad hoc committee of residents, of homeowners, to assist in the planning. Um, we found that we had a lot of expertise among the unit owners. And once the project was finalized, uh, we had another open meeting. And at that open meeting, we had the contractor and our attorney, our accountant, Ed was in at our, that, that meeting. Um, we had the supplier of all of the materials that we, we picked. So that any of the questions, any questions the residents could have, would be answered that day. The ad hoc committee worked with the engineer and reported their recommendations back to the board. And that included colors and design of the building, how the buildings would look. The engineering firm that we hired presented us with options with, with costs. And they developed the bid specifications. Um, after the spec specifications were developed, with, they gave us a list of qualified bidders. We went out to those bidders. Um, I believe we had six that came back with, with bids for the project. Um, we had the engineering firm help us evaluate the bid to make sure that everything that was included in the project that we wanted included was there. In our project, we replaced the siding, the gutters and leaders, um, all the trim, and we also replaced, we have chimney chases, so we replaced the covers on top of the chimney chase. We also continued having our engineer on site to monitor the construction. While we were trying to get the um, homeowners on board, we put the specs and the project rendering, um, what the buildings would look like. We put that on our website. 
which was a, um, a, a big plus for the homeowners to see what it was going to look like when it was all done. The bid process, um, we depended a lot on our engineering firm for this process. They helped us qualify the bidders, um, choosing contractors that they had worked with before and contractors they knew would be able to complete this project. Um, the, uh, obviously, the financial strength of the contractor is important. You don't want the project started and then have a problem in the middle of it. Um, the engineering firm also helped us with references to be sure that the contractors were qualified to do the project. Um, we actually did have this question the, question the bidders with a very low bid. We actually did, I believe we had six uh, qualified bidders. And we had two bids that were on the low side, a couple in the middle, and a couple on the high side. My association, my trustees, chose to take the low bidder. We did after we decided to take the low bidder. It was considerably lower than the rest of the group. We asked that contractor to come in so that we could be sure that they had everything in the contract, that there wasn't anything missing, and that the reason why their bid was lower than everyone else's was that they missed a big part of it. Um, it actually worked out well, and we started the, we did award that contract to that um, contractor at the lower cost than any of the other contractors. We had our attorney involvement. Um, our attorney went over all the contracts to be sure that everything was um, online as far as the paperwork was required. And we decided to structure the payments. Each homeowner, this was divided by 438 homeowners equally, the entire project. Uh, we did allow some of the homeowners to prepay and in allowing some of the homeowners to prepay, which they did, we did not have to borrow um, as quickly as we thought we would have to. Most of the construction time, we had money to pay for that construction until towards the end of the project. We did include a timetable for the start and completion of the project. We were very um, strict with the contractor in reference to that. We wanted the project completed in 18 months and it was actually completed in 18 months. I will pass this back to Ed Wilkin. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Uh, it was, it, your story was uh, quite interesting, and uh, it's remarkable how smooth it went uh, using the steps that you described. Uh, I'm going to now give you um, another polling question. Um, this polling question uh, wants to get a little bit of an idea on uh, how those of you that have done projects in the past, how you uh, actually funded those projects. So uh, we're going to take a few seconds here, try to answer quickly again. Select one with, uh, with what the uh, most of the uh, projects you've done with uh, the, mo the majority of them. Okay, uh, I'm going to give you the results back. I actually like this. I'm glad I see a, uh, that somebody in the audience has a little bit of humor. Uh, the, uh, we had 6% for the garage and cake sale, so that, that's uh, quite cool. Um, it looks like the majority of you funded them through uh, the replacement funds. I, I'm, I'm quite proud of, of the whole group here that, uh, that you've had adequate reserves and that uh, that, that's, a, that's a very good answer. Second was through special or, or emergency assessments. And um, back down there tied with garage and cake sales is bank financing. So uh, there's an opportunity here for our two bankers to uh, step up and, and help you out later on. Uh, so we're going to be talking a little bit about evaluating the options that you have for the project. Uh, you, of course, have the most logical one if you don't have uh, the reserves in place, and that would be uh, to fund it through a special or emergency assessment. Um, the thing that you've got to look at in the documents is very important. Um, 
there's a big difference between a special assessment and an emergency assessment. Quite often, special assessments require uh, voting from the board members, so from the residents, excuse me. So you, you, if you do want to go this route, uh, you need to be able to see whether you can uh, go through an emergency assessment or you're going to have to go through the voting process with the residents. Um, you also want to look at the ability for the owners in the, re in the community and whether they have the ability to pay within the time frame required for the project if you're going to be doing it through special or emergency assessments. What I'm talking about here, if you're going to start the project in June and it's going to be completed in six months, you're going to need to have all that money collected in six months or less. So it's important that you look at the um, financial resources of your, uh, of your owners and see that that's going to be possible. Um, the second alternative is through through bank financing, um, and actually we we got. I'm going to go back to this to talk a little bit. The banker is going to talk about this a little bit long, uh, earlier. Um, there's a couple different ways to pay for the bank families for the repaying, and uh, I'm sure the bankers are going to talk a little bit about that. But you have two ways of doing it: either dealing with it with um, a special assessment or, or an emergency assessment or including the payments uh, in the annual um, budget of the association. And there are, there are pluses and minuses to each of that situation. One, if you put it in the budget, of course your maintenance fees are going to be substantially higher. And uh, by putting it as a special assessment, although cosmetically it, it's the equivalent, um, when the the president owner sells his unit and he um, goes on and a new owner comes in, typically the old owner would pay off the special assessment and the new owner would start fresh with a lower maintenance fee. Uh, I'm going to go backwards on the slide. We skipped one here. Um, I want to talk about replacement uh, funds that are available to do the project and whether or not you uh, are qualified to use those funds. And what I mean by this, is the item actually included in the replacement reserve study? For instance, if you um, wanted to do an addition on the clubhouse, it's obvious that's not going to be an item that you've been setting aside money for, uh, typically in a replacement study. If you're uh, going to be replacing a roof, typically that's an item that's in a replacement study. Uh, the other thing you want to look at is, because quite often there's not enough money for that particular item in the reserve study, you're going to want to look at what the future, uh, foreseeable future needs are going to be. Um, and you might want to get your engineer who did your reserve study in to do an, an update, uh, look at the um, items in place, do an on-site actual review of the, uh, of the uh, components of the reserve study, and see if he still feels comfortable with the estimated life and cost that he's included in the previous study. If you, want to, you want to see that if you go out and borrow money for instance, to do the roof today, that you're not going to need to do the pavement in two years and exhaust the whole fund. So it takes a little bit uh, looking into and, and foreseeing the foreseeable future and, and taking a look at that. What I wanted to talk about now, I have a, a, an example. Uh, these are some facts. We have a facade on this, on this building that prematurely failed. The estimated cost of the facade is $900,000, and it needs to be done immediately as we have water causing major problems, uh, mold uh, going all the way through and, and uh, into the uh, inside of the units and doing damage inside the units. So these are some of the facts on this association. This is an example. Uh, this is the actual association's replacement reserve study. Uh, this is a 100-unit community. And as you can see, they, uh, of course, like, there's only six items here in a typical reserve study. You have quite, quite a few more, but I wanted to have something that would fit on one page. Uh, you'll notice that the funding to date is $735,000. Um, this assumes that you have $735,000 in the bank. A lot of times your, your schedule and your financial statement will show that you're supposed to have $735,000 in the bank but you have an interfund balance and you only have $400,000 actually set aside. So you need to look at that first. So 
we look at this, we uh, talk to our engineer, and then we come up with the alternatives we have to fund this project. The first alternative we have is we can use all the replacement fund and special assets for the balance. So if you notice on this schedule, we have $750,000 replacement cost, and we have $200,000 specifically set aside for that item. So in this example, we're going to take the whole $735,000 and use it all to fund the project. And from there, we will special assess for the difference. In this case, you would need to special assess for $165,000 or $1,650 per unit. But because you're exhausting the whole maintenance, uh, whole replacement study on this, you're now going to go to the fourth, the last column in this example. Since we're now using, using all the money, we're now going to have to accelerate to collect for the other five items. So if you look in the column all the way to the right, Instead of funding $186,750, you're now going to have to fund $342,500, which is now a maintenance fee per month uh, for reserves of $285 versus the $155, or $125 more per month. So that's, a, that's option one as to what you might do uh, with this situation. Option two would only be use the replacement fund uh, that monies we have set aside for the replacement fund for the facade and special assess the balance. In that case, we have $200,000 set, set aside for that line item, the exterior facade, the third item down. So we have $200,000, so we're going to take the $200,000 and use that. And then we're going to special assess for $7,000. Now, uh, granted, uh, this project in this example was needed to be done right away, so that $7,000 is going to have to be collected in, you know, at the most probably, you know, 60 to 90 days. So again, you've got to qualify your residents. Are they going to be able to come up with that kind of money? And of course, there'll be no change in the maintenance fees because we're not disrupting the rest of the items in the replacement study. Uh, the third option would be to use the replacement fund to the extent of the facade, the $200,000, and take a loan for the balance. Uh, in my example, I assumed a 6% interest rate over 10 years. In this example, um, the monthly assessment would go up $7,800 $78, uh, per month, or, and of course the maintenance fee, the payment on the loan would be $7,800 divided by 100 units. So those are, are the three examples of um, how you would handle uh, looking at you know, it's quite. I did. I did it in five minutes. It would take you quite a, a longer period of time to come up with these different items. It's going to have, uh, take your uh, your banker, uh, your engineer, and, and uh, contractor to, to look at these to come up with the costs and, and evaluate the funding options for the project. Okay, we're. I'm done with my uh, my talk right now, but I am going to do the third polling question before the bankers. Um, step in, and uh, the polling question is, uh, there it is, okay. Uh, the question is, what is your most critical concern about taking out a bank loan to finance a capital project? Now, um, I saw that only 6%, which is one or two people, actually finance this, so this would be a question that, uh, that a subject would be quite, quite interesting to the speaker. So I'm going to let you answer the question uh, now. And then uh, I will let the uh, bankers come in and, and, and go over the answers that you guys have uh, come up with as a result of this. Thank you very much. Over the questions, uh, so we have 56 percent of the owners talking about how they're going to be able to afford to uh, repay it. We have coming in second, 
uh, giving our financial condition, how will we get it approved, and uh, tied for last is what the collateral is and what the bank, uh, whether the bank will require personal guarantees. Um, what, it, what, is, what is cool is actually uh, the bankers are going to give you the answers to all three, all four of these questions. So uh, I'm going to let Dave and Steve uh, take over and there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. This is Steve Block. I'm going to be handling the first portion of the, uh, of the lender's, lender's perspective. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank both Ed Wilkin, Ed Gutton Plan, and the entire staff that's worked on the project at Wilkin and Gutton Plan for coordinating and executing this webinar. Before I start with the content of the lenders part of the program, I'd like to make a couple of comments on capital improvement projects from a board member's perspective because I have been one before. The process of developing, selling, and coordinating a capital project is a very difficult one for board members. When you own your own home and there are projects to be done, you do some research, make your decisions, and you live by them. In an association, you as a board member are entrusted and responsible to work for the entire community and the individual unit owners, all of whom have their own desires and concerns. We believe that it's important for board members or finance committee members to meet with prospective lenders to completely understand the terms, structures, and options of the financing. I live in a condominium association myself, and when our community of 80 units needed $1 million for capital improvements, we went through the same process though not as efficiently as Kathy did in Union Gap situation. When it was apparent that we would need bank financing because our reserves wouldn't cover the cost of the project, I knew that I could not bring my association to my bank. I did, however, bring in two of my friendly competitors, one who was David Sharabani, who got our business. David will be presenting the sections tonight on loan terms and structure. As you learned in the Union Gap situation, there are many parties involved in this process. I'll call them the project team. Coordination and cooperation among these players is critical to efficient movement of the project. We have the banker, the board, and there's possibly a finance, uh, finance group, the management company, or in the case of uh, Union Gap, the actual, or Kathy is the actual on-site property manager the attorney, the accountant, the engineer, and the contractor. I'm now going to run through some of the information that banks look for when we uh, take an application. Some of this is very basic, and I'll get around to talking about why we need it uh, as we go a little further along. Uh, so we start off with some basic community inf uh, information, the number of units, an estimated current value of those units, uh, the number of rental units, which is an important factor for us, uh, the number of units that might be in foreclosure. We also ask for copies of probably three years, audited financial statements, and in most cases, copies of tax returns. Additionally, we ask for what we'll call the most recent interim financial statement package. Um, if you're a uh, calendar year-end uh, uh, tax year, um, we will then often ask in the middle of the year to get the end a monthly report package that your management company would prepare for you which would include income statement, balance sheet, variances to, uh, to budget. Uh, it will also include uh, an age delinquency report, which is a key factor for us when we do our underwriting. We ask for a unit owner roster. We ask for a list of the board members with their titles, uh, the budget, which would be included in the uh, interim report package. We do like to see six months' worth of minutes from the association. Um, in, in most cases, we would like to see the replacement or reserve, or reserve study. This is a very important factor, which I'll go into uh, in, a, in a little bit. We'd also like to see a copy of your insurance coverages. And in some cases, um, we would like to see a copy of your reported association documents uh, up front with all, with all amendments. Um, Something that's come up more recently is uh, the status of your association and whether you have received um, a, a, uh, an approval for the complex for FHA financing. It's become very difficult in a lot of cases to get one-off mortgages for unit owners when a property is being uh, sold and, and, and purchased. Um, if the uh, complex can obtain FHA approval up front, it becomes a lot, a lot easier 
and that's becoming a uh, more important factor as we've gone through some of the changes in the mortgage market recently. We also take a look at the project information, um, and we want to talk about the specific types of work you're doing, and take a look at the project budget if you have one at that particular uh, that particular time. So now we've asked for all this information from you. What do us bankers really do with all of it? Um, we have, uh, and I'll kind of speak in, uh, for David and myself, we've talked about this uh, on a number of occasions. Some of the key factors we look, at, we look at are the amount of the loan in relation to the property values, what we might call a loan-to-value ratio. Um, we like to try to keep those figures uh, somewhat more in line with the, uh, with the, value, of the value of the units. That becomes an important factor. Obviously, the lower uh, the amount uh, that we're lending to each individual unit, if you were to combine them all, the better the loan we take, we take a look at. Uh, we take a look at the delinquency levels, and the delinquency levels have become more of a factor over the last couple of years with the economic uh, downturn. We've seen a rise in those, though um, in most cases they're still at levels that are, that are acceptable. We take a look at the percentage of rental units. Um, we don't like to see uh, an excessive amount of rental units. I would also, which I didn't put in here, is we like to see uh, projects that are already through their transition phase. The next three items, cash reserves, replacement funding levels, replacement study, uh, indicating the needs during the term of the loan. And I'm going to ask to kind of look at those all as one package. And it, it applies a little bit to the example that Ed Wilkin gave uh, earlier in the presentation. Um, when, when you take a look at the work that needs to be done, we, we want to, you're, you're going to have to fund it in a certain way. And whether you're looking at what the cash you have up front uh, and how much money you'll need for the project is one component of it, but the uh, replacement study, a reserve study, is very important to us. Because if you were to come to us and ask us for a loan of, say, a million dollars, and we thought that that was, uh, that was reasonable and a prudent uh, risk for us to take, but if we look at the reserve study and found out that you needed $3 million over the term of the loan, we would have to ask you how are you going to be able to fund the balance, the balance of that. So if you take those items uh, together, those are things that we really kind of, uh, kind of really have to look at uh, as a group. And obviously, the better the cash reserves, whether you're using them or not, some associations want to keep uh, high levels of reserves and borrow in any case. Um, and we do, but we do want to see how much work is going to be needed in the community over the course of the loan and even beyond in some cases. Um, that obviously becomes important as your ability to, uh, to, to pay the loan off. Um, next, I would say we, uh, we go out and see the property. We get a general impression of the property, the amenities. We talk to the board. We want to talk to the management company and any of the professionals that are being uh, involved in the deal team. So you ask, uh, what is our collateral for the loans? In the case, uh, it basically, as Ed had said, these loans basically get repaid from uh, either the special assessments or an increase in the, in the budget. As collateral, we basically take a lien on the assets of the association, which is effectively, in almost all cases, the right to collect cash from the, uh, from the unit owners, whether it's in the form of an assessment or in the form of increased common charges. Uh, there generally is not real estate collateral. Uh, there are some cases, um, I've done some projects in New York City where we take, uh, we may take a, 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 a supers unit as collateral specifically. Uh, but in most cases in, in, in suburban communities, we're just basically taking a, looking at the right to collect cash and get that from the, from the association. A couple of important things. There are no liens on anyone's unit. There are no personal guarantees from any of the unit owners, nor when the board members sign the loan documentation. Uh, it's really a very clean transaction between the bank and the association itself. No liens on any <laughs> units, no personal guarantees. This basically completes my portion of the lender's perspective. And I'd like to thank all the participants and encourage, encourage any further dialogue if your, com if your community is considering a capital project. At this point, I'll pass the program over to Dave Sharabani. Thank you very much, Steve. And thank you very much, Ed Wilkin and Ed Guttenplan. I appreciate very much the opportunity to speak about this. Um, it's been very nice for you to have us here. Um, I just want to basically just 
a little bit about myself. I've been in the business for six years. Um, I predominantly, the reason why I'm giving my background is the perspective that I'm going to give tonight on these next two slides as it applies on a national level and the level that I see in the Northeast. Um, I'm really going to speak generically, not necessarily about the way my bank looks at things from these perspectives, but what I've seen by meeting uh, people in um, national events that I've traveled to through CAI and, um, and even on the internet there's been some groups. Um, basically I just want to define three terms uh, going forward that are very common when you approach a bank that are, that are spoken of that uh, you may hear and I think it's a good idea to really familiarize yourself as you come to a bank for the loan process. Um, amortization is a term you hear a lot. A bank is going to run an amortization schedule. Basically, this points to paying back the bank. Um, it's defined simply as the process of decreasing or accounting for the amount owed over a period of time. A bank amortizes the loan, and basically, as you're paying back the bank, you're paying a portion of principal and interest as the loan matures and goes through its life. And just like anybody that's had a conventional mortgage, that mix, in essence, changes as the loan goes through its life. You're going to wind up paying more principal and less interest as the loan matures. Most associations, and in closing, will receive an amortization schedule so they can basically see how much interest they're going to pay over the life of the loan, and they can really determine, more importantly, the principal balance, what's going to be owed to the bank at different stages of the life of the loan. It's, it's a good number to really have a handle on just in case something unforeseen comes up or prepayments occur. Um, a line of credit, basic part of any loan structure. It's also commonly called a drawdown period. It's where the borrower draws down money, a ability to draw, such as a line, for the project. The payments on the line are interest only, meaning the bank is not yet getting paid back the money it, it's owed. During the line phase, an association can pay more than the interest bill that it's getting from the bank, thereby reducing the line. And that's called a non-revolving line of credit. Almost exclusively, if an association comes to a bank, it's going to be offered a non-revolving line of credit. That simply means if it's paying down more than the interest portion, the line does not revert back to its original amount, but it stays at where it is. Associations are just not uh, offered revolving lines. It's a different risk perspective from a bank. Um, a term. The term portion of the loan is what amortizes the amount borrowed over a period of time to pay back the bank the money that's owed, which is called the principal balance. The payment consists of principal and interest at this point. The composition of principal and interest changes as the loan shifts through its period. During this period, and I think it was touched upon briefly by Ed before, if the association wants to pay down during the term an additional amount, the payments during the term phase don't change. So the note would be retired earlier, which is a common thing that happens. A lot of times associations will come during this point and look to protect themselves from a cash flow point of view. They'll pay down the loan because they've come into money from unit owners, an insurance settlement or whatever it may be, but they're going to want to reduce the monthly payment for cash flow protection down the road, the bank would simply re-amortize the loan, set up a new schedule, basically not modifying the note and retiring the note with the reduced payment. That's done by a lot of banks. Consult your local bank. There's sometimes there's a fee attached to that, and a bank will probably limit you on how often you can do that. Um, basically, those are the straight definitions. Um, just getting into the structures. The structures are an important part of what you want to approach to the bank. When you're approaching the bank and the bank has a good idea that the deal could get done, it's going to want to ask you a lot of questions on the structure. Basically, what kind of loan the association is looking for, how long you want to go out, how much money you need, and how much money you need, also I'll get into a little later briefly, there's a depository relationship attached almost all the time with banks. Um, there are two basic structures that 
an association will look at, I'll touch upon the one that's not used as much, which is a straight term. A straight term, simply put, the association gets all the proceeds from the loan at closing dispersed to them, up front. No line of credit attached. It's, it's done for three reasons, briefly. The first reason is on the lower end loans, from my experience in speaking to other bankers as well, I'd say generally I'll use a number of 250000 or under. A bank is probably going to want to encourage an association maybe to stay away from the line. Um, it's simply a smaller amount. I don't think a line necessarily is, is – they're not looking to save the interest at that point. And from a bank's perspective, a bank is looking to, to basically control its cost and margin on the loan. All loans, regardless of the size, are going to have a certain amount of service attached to them during the life of the loan, and the bank is really looking at its profit margin and looking to, in essence, curtail that by, by not offering the line. So on a smaller loan, the bank may, may push you towards not taking a line. Um, the project calls for an upfront accelerated payment. An association, instead of going through for a line, may need all of the money in a from a quicker point of view. Two examples that come to mind that we've lent for, um, a window project, the manufacturer needed the money for the windows up front, which is a larger portion of the project than the actual installation of the windows. Um, as Steve touched upon, the financing of a supers unit, there's no need for a line. The association needs the money up front. So basically, if the money is needed up front, there's no need for a line. Um, another reason third reason I'd give is simply the association wants to, over the life of the loan, save the interest payments associated with a line of credit, and they simply want to attack the principal and interest immediately. I mean, it's more prudent, obviously, for an association ultimately not to have a loan on the books. They don't know what, what unforeseen event could happen in the future. So it, having the line of credit, not having one uh, in this scenario basically uh, retires the principal portion by attacking it with a payment immediately. Those are the three reasons for a straight term. Let me touch upon the line of credit into a term. The line of credit basically is done for three reasons. Um, you basically want to you want to save interest early on, but you don't need all the money up front. The association can accurately budget for debt service at conversion as well. Um, line of credit length. Basically, most banks want to see 12 to 24 months. Um, this is flexible. A bank can go past that, really, depending on, on the scope and nature of the product, uh, project. The line of credit length is going to coincide with how long the project takes. Um, the term length, the bank doesn't want to go more than the life of the, of the project that they're lending for. Bottom line, um, if it's you know a painting or roofing project for 20 years, a bank's not going to want to run for 25 years and then have a note on the original project and the association, in theory, could come back and have to address that as well. Um, other kinds of structures, not as often. A balloon structure, some of you may be familiar with. This is an association looking to basically, um, in a cash flow situation, is looking to cut down on their monthly payment and they're, they're looking to amortize the loan for greater than the length of the loan. Um, this, the negative on this is that you have to address a balloon payment at the end of the term. So you'd really want to sit down with a board and, and have them understand exactly what the payment is. Uh, rates versus floating rates. Uh, associations basically, um, why, why does the association have non-operating reserves in the bank? The amount of placed on is worked out with the association. This touches on the depository relationship. Banks are going to want to see an association have a depository relationship with the bank. It's going to affect the rate. Um, it's called the compensating balance in the business. Uh, fees, fees on the uh, basically will be stated on the commitment letter. It's the bank's going to be. Re is the association is going to be responsible for the bank's attorney fee and a loan fee, sometimes called an underwriting fee. It's going to be disclosed on the commitment letter. Some banks may charge an application or underwriting fee as well. It's applied to overall closing costs. Um, and just basically, I just 
uh, to end with determining the amount to borrow. This should be worked out with the management firm and the board. Um, it's very important that you get an accurate feel on this as the association doesn't want to under borrow or over borrow. And I'd like to thank you very much for your time. The home stretch. Okay. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ken Sauter. Um, we're going to try and go through the rest of this fairly quickly. Um, I know it's late. Um, it's late for all of us, but we'll uh, we'll get you through this. The um, I really just want to focus on the, the role of the closing attorney. It was touched on before that the attorney may be involved in, in connection with negotiation of the construction contract, but we're talking tonight, or I'm talking tonight primarily about the, uh, the closing aspects of it. You've done your financial planning. Um, you've got your uh, project planning pretty much underway. Uh, it seems like the board is deciding to proceed with the loan as the best avenue. Uh, so now what are you doing? Uh, hopefully there's been some contact with the, uh, the association's attorney. Uh, it is critically, critically important that everybody is on the same page and very important that you bring the attorney into the process early on. It makes no sense to have done all this homework, all this work, decided to go forward with the project, only to find out that the association's board may not have the, the power and the authority to actually borrow the money and may have to go out to the membership. You may also find that the governing documents have very, very uh, different provisions with respect to uh, levels of authority, dollar thresholds, um, is it a capital improvement or is, is it a capital replacement? Uh, every set of governing documents is different. So please, please uh, try to consult with your attorney as early on in the, in the process as possible. It will make a world of difference as to you know, what direction you're going in. Um, I handle a fair amount of loans on behalf of lenders, do some on behalf of associations as well. Um, and do some general uh, lender representation. A lot of it is paperwork, and it's really just getting your arms around what needs to be done, who needs to do it, and when they need to do it. And I view my position as the attorney for, for a bank and for an association borrower to be sort of the facilitator. I'm the one that's supposed to know how to talk uh, the language, how to know what needs to get done. I may not know how to get it done. Um, I'll look to other people to do that. But it's a matter of uh, looking at things that need to get done, assigning those responsibilities to the people who have or are in a position to do it. Um, I'd like to at least touch base with everybody who's involved, and you saw the list of uh, consultants and individuals who ought to be part of the process early on to make sure we're all doing what we're supposed to be doing. There are some tasks that will run sort of chronologically. There are some tasks that uh, will sort of run on, a, on parallel courses. Um, you ought to be aware that some lenders will actually require the construction contracts to be in place um, before they will lend. So make sure that uh, if that's going to be a requirement that you've got that well underway. That means having your engineer put together the specs, going out to bid, at least having selected your, uh, your prospective contractors and being ready to move on with the contracts. Uh, when your, your attorney comes into the, the process, that attorney has to be looking at your particular governing documents and your authority to borrow, your authority to assess, um, and again, those threshold levels and, and all the governing documents are different. So it's not one size fits all. The, 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 these kinds of projects are often very, very hot topics. They can be very controversial in association. You may have members who are for the project. You have members who may again, be against it. You may not know until you actually start to get into the project and that first notice of a possible assessment has gone out. So again, it's critically essential that you at least have, as an attorney, counseled your client to make sure that they have the, the legal authority to do what they're doing and in the way they're doing. Uh, somebody ought to be taking a look at the documentation and the, uh, the notice and the meeting requirements, requirements in your governing documents, particularly in your bylaws. I'm somewhat surprised that, um, that managers don't pick up the phone a little bit more often and just call their attorney find out what kind of notice provisions apply. There are different uh, provisions that may apply to membership meetings for approval versus board meetings for approval, uh, different kinds of requirements. You may want to put together proxies, ballots, um, absentee ballots, directed ballots, whatever it takes to, to get the requisite approval. Um, the attorneys ought to be there to help you to make sure that those documents are being done in accordance with your governing documents. If it's a, a controversial project and you've got a group of objectors who may be trying to shut down that project, 
um, it's very easy to have made some kind of a technical slip that can stop a project in its tracks. Um, you want to have the attorney taking a look at the loan commitment before it's actually accepted. Uh, make sure that the terms and conditions of that loan commitment are something that the association can comply with, um, that it conforms to the, the board's understanding of what the general business terms are supposed to be. Uh, Dave mentioned before there are going to be costs. So make sure that you have your uh, have a handle on what those costs are going to be. The, um, the attorney ought to be taking a look at the form of the lender's opinion letter because your attorney is going to be asked to provide an opinion that says that the association has the authority to borrow the money in the manner that it's doing it, either by a board approval or membership approval. Another reason that you might as well ask that question of your own attorney well in advance of, of going, down the, uh, going down the road. Have your attorney sometime early in the process make sure that your corporate charter is in effect. Very simple to do, uh, but you'd be amazed at how many times there's been a change in management or direction and the, uh, the annual filings have not been kept up to date. That can slow down a loan. You obviously have to be a corporation in good standing in order to borrow money in the state of New Jersey. Um, as far as loan documentation, um, what I like to do as the borrower's attorney is to get a hold of the lender's checklist, make sure that what's on that checklist is consistent with your loan commitment. The loan commitment is through the outline of the basic terms. The checklist is the, is the list of documents that need to be provided. I mentioned before that that checklist might include something like a, uh, an accepted form of contract with a, uh, a budget for construction. Um, obviously, those commitments ought to have all the terms that were um, probably discussed between the, the board and their, uh, their, uh, their friendly banker to make sure it's got the interest rate, the terms, the loan amounts, the funding requirements, and everything else that you thought was going to be in the commitment. Um, there are several types of, of loan documents that you're going to have to be involved in. It's really more the, the function of the attorney to make sure that those documents are reasonable, appropriate. Every lender is going to have a little different position on how negotiable those documents are going to be. What was mentioned before is there are no personal guarantees. The, uh, the primary collateral is the ability of the lender following an event of default to be able to start to collect the assessments, general assessments, special assessments, if there are any, um, all fairly routine documents. But the concept is it's the, the cash flow of the assessments that's essentially securing the loan. And uh, I'm nearly out of breath because I had to say that in uh, seven minutes instead of ten. So I'll, uh, I'll turn that over to our host. Thank you, Ken. You did an awesome job of speed lecturing and we appreciate that. Uh, there are a couple of questions that have been that have been um, emailed in. I'm going to try to go through them and still end up close to our end time. Um, the first one was whether Ed Wilkin was willing to give out the recipes for the cupcakes in the cake sale and I've advised him that that's uh, proprietary information of the firm and we're not going to provide the cupcake recipes. <laughs> so you're all on your own. Um, uh, first question for Kathy, and this is my, my own question, which is, <clears throat> it seems like there was a lot of transparency and communication with your unit owners about this process. Maybe you can comment on how important it was for your success to have communication.